So this is second video on acute rheumatic fever in which I have majorly covered the salient features of the various clinical criteria and explained them properly and have also included prevention and treatment. And this treatment part also includes the, it is inclusive of the IAP standard treatment guidelines on acute rheumatic fever issued this year itself. So this is very important from the examination point of view. So why at all it is important to know the prevention and the treatment of acute rheumatic fever? Why? Because the most dreaded complication of acute rheumatic fever is rheumatic heart disease, which can sometimes even be fatal. And of course, morbidity is there. So the first major clinical criterion, arthritis, is the major criteria seen in around 75% patients of acute rheumatic fever. It is migratory means that once one joint has healed completely, only then shall the symptoms appear in the next contiguous joint. That is, the arthritis migrates from one joint to the next contiguous joint. It primarily involves the large joints, sparing the small joints of hands and feet and also of spine. The pain is disproportionate to the objective findings and it is exquisitely tender. It is non-deforming compared to a very common form of arthritis in children that is juvenile idiopathic arthritis which was previously referred to as juvenile rheumatoid arthritis and it is inversely related to the severity of carditis. So if the arthritis is very severe, carditis is likely to be mild and vice versa. But one of the very diagnostic points is that it shows a very dramatic response to salicylates. Rather, it is said that a child with fever and arthritis should be watched for the migratory nature of arthritis before jumping on to prescribing salicylates because salicylates will, if it is rheumatic arthritis, you are not sure. And before eliciting the migratory nature, if you are given salicylates, then it will mask that feature. Then carditis is seen in around 50 to 60 percent cases of acute rheumatic fever. So it is the next most common clinical criterion. It can either be clinical, that is the patient can be symptomatic with a murmur or it can be subclinical, that is patient is not symptomatic, there is no symptom sign but on the echocardiograph you have that feature. Carditis and rheumatic heart disease are the most serious manifestations of rheumatic fever. It is a pancarditis means that it involves all three layers of the heart that is pericardium, myocardium and endocardium. The involvement of endocardium is a must while myocarditis and or pericarditis without endocarditis is almost never rheumatic in origin. This you must remember. It varies in severity and mitral valve is the most commonly involved valve seen in around 75% cases, aortic valve in 30% cases. And tricuspid and pulmonary valves are very less involved, seen in less than 5% of cases. And isolated right sided cardiac involvement is very rare. Also, it is an early manifestation of rheumatic fever like arthritis and erythema marginatum. Again, we, as we have seen earlier, there is an inverse relation between the severity of arthritis and carditis. The pathognomic histological region of rheumatic myocarditis is ASCOF nodules as you can see in the picture in the scene and carditis is the only manifestation of rheumatic fever which leads a sequelae and permanent damage to the organ. In acute phase it usually the endocarditis especially presents usually as valvulitis and the most common lesion is mitral regurgitation whereas in chronic phase that is in cases of established heart disease. It is no longer acute carditis, it is an established heart disease. There shall be fibrosis, calcification and stenosis of heart walls. And the heart walls are typically referred to as fish mouth walls or puckered walls. These are the eco findings, the Doppler criteria and the morphological criteria which have been given by the American Heart Association. Anyone interested can go through them in detail. Now, chorea is seen in around 10 to 15 percent patients of acute rheumatic fever only. It is a late symptom sign such that you cannot, you might not be able to establish a temporal relationship with group A beta hemolytic streptococcus infection also because the antibody titer would already have had declined it occurs sometimes so late. 
It is associated with emotional lability and poor coordination which is exacerbated by stress and relieved by sleep. So if a patient of chorea comes to your OPD, then this is one of the very classical findings you should elicit on history, whether it or not it is exacerbated by stress and relieved with sleep. And the fact is that it rarely ever causes neurological sequelae. The various clinical maneuvers to elicit it, sometimes it is asked in the exam and especially the residents are asked to demonstrate it. Milkmaid's grip, spooning and pronation of arms when extended, wormian that is worm like movements of tongue on protrusion of the tongue by the patient and evaluation of the handwriting of the patient. Erythema marginatum is seen in just 1% patients, 1% of patients with acute rheumatic fever. It majorly involves the trunks and extremities but definitely spares the face. And the characteristics you can appreciate in the picture also. It is erythematous, especially the margins, serpiginous that is snake-like, macular lesion that is not raised from the skin with a pale center. It is non-pruritic which is very important for making a diagnosis and it is accentuated on warming the skin. Subcutaneous nodules are even more rare. They are seen in less than equal to 1% of cases of acute rheumatic fever. They are 0.5 to 1 cm size and firm and seen majorly on the extensor surfaces of the limbs on the tendons near the bony prominences and they correlate with significant established rheumatic heart disease. Now coming on to the treatment part of rheumatic fever. There are basically four components of treatment. First is the primary prevention in which you eradicate the streptococcal organism which is present in the throat of the patient. That is when the patient presents with pharyngitis you give it an antibiotic course to the patient to prevent the development of any attack, the first attack of acute rheumatic fever. Next is the anti-inflammatory treatment. When inflammation or rheumatic fever has already set in, then you want to give the anti-inflammatory treatment like aspirin or steroids to lessen the intensity of inflammation. Next is the supportive management which is of course one of the most major chunks in management of acute rheumatic fever. And last but not the least is secondary prevention. Secondary prevention is when the primary acute rheumatic first initial attack of the acute rheumatic fever has already occurred. But you want that the patient should not suffer any recurrent attack of or repeat attack of rheumatic fever again. So, if the patient presents with acute rheumatic fever, you must give him bed rest, monitor for carditis and give him per oral penicillin or amoxicillin for 10 days or single stat dose of IM benzathine penicillin. If the patient is allergic to penicillin, in that case you can give erythromycin for 10 days or azithromycin for 5 days or clindamycin for 10 days in order of that preference. So these antibiotics that is penicillin or amoxicillin, I am benzathine penicillin and in cases of penicillin allergy that is erythro, azithro and clindamycin, these constitute drugs for primary prevention. That is a patient has pharyngitis and you don't want the patient to develop acute rheumatic fever, especially if it is streptococcal pharyngitis. Now, if the patient of acute rheumatic fever has arthritis or he has carditis without cardiomegaly or congestive heart failure, in that case, the anti-inflammatory treatment you begin is aspirin. The dose is 50 to 70 mg per kg per day divided in 4 doses for 3 to 5 days followed by 50 mg per kg per day in, three, in 4 divided doses for 3 weeks and followed by half daily dose for another 4 to 6 weeks. But in case the patient of acute rheumatic fever has carditis with more than minimal cardiomegaly on x-ray and or congestive heart failure, then in that case the anti-inflammatory drug you prefer is per oral prednisolone. The dose is 2 mg per kg per day QID for 3 weeks, followed by half dose for 2 to 3 weeks and followed by tapering of the dose at the rate 5 mg per day every 2 to 3 days. And on tapering of prednisolone, you should start aspirin at the rate of 50 mg per kg per day QID for 6 weeks to prevent any rebound inflammation on stopping prednisolone. Along with this, supportive therapy is a must which includes oxygen, bed rest, salt and fluid restriction and digoxin and diuretics for the management of congestive heart failure. 
So now you are clear about the second step of the treatment of acute rheumatic fever that is the anti-inflammatory treatment which comprises of either aspirin or prednisolone. Now if the patient presents with chorea, in that case the drugs are absolutely different. What you do is you give phenobarbitone or haloperidol or clonazepam, monitor the patient for carditis and rule out other causes of chorea, for example Huntington's chorea, Wilson's disease and SLE. We have seen that the Jones criteria is not essential to make the diagnosis of acute rheumatic fever in patients with chorea not explained by any other cause. We have seen in the previous video. And in case you wish to revise, you can see the link in the box below. Now primary prophylaxis, as I have already told you, the patient has pharyngitis. We don't want the patient to develop rheumatic fever or the patient has developed rheumatic fever and you want to eradicate the streptococcal infection in the throat to prevent the cross reactivity between the streptococcal antigens and the antigens in various organ systems of the body. This we had already discussed in the previous video. So as we have already seen it comprises of the oral penicillin that is penicillin V or amoxicillin or intramuscular injection benzathine penicillin G or crystalline penicillin. If the patient is allergic to penicillin then you need to start erythro, azithro or clindamycin. But what is important to remember here is that 30% patients of acute rheumat rheumatic fever do not even recall a preceding episode of sore throat. So, the, so they don't even seek medical advice. But in case the patient presents, you need to give this treatment. Now secondary prophylaxis as we have already seen is initiated against a subsequent attack of rheumatic fever because any further attack of rheumatic fever can increase the risk of rheumatic heart disease many fold. So in case the patient has rheumatic fever with carditis and the residual heart disease is present, then you must give the prophylaxis at least for 10 years since the last episode or up till the age of 40 years that he, up to adulthood beyond even, even beyond that. And sometimes lifelong prophylaxis might be required. If the patient has rheumatic fever with carditis but no residual heart disease, then you must give prophylaxis at least for 10 years since the last episode or up to 21 years of age whichever is later and if the patient has rheumatic fever without carditis then in that case you need to give prophylaxis at least for 5 years or up to the age of 21 years whichever is longer. So depends on whether or not the patient has carditis or whether or not the patient has residual heart disease. Now the drug which you give for secondary prophylaxis is single intramuscular dose of benzathine penicillin G which is given every 4 weeks and in some areas at higher risk you can repeat the dose at every three weeks also and the dose is around 600,000 international units in patients with weight less than equal to 60 pounds and 1.2 million international units of penicillin G in patients more than 60 pounds and in case the patient is very compliant you can also give the patient oral doses of penicillin B250 milligram BD and penicillin B1000 milligram OD in the respective weight bands. So to summarize, the order of frequency of major criteria which is sometimes asked in the exam and even in the post-PG entrance examinations if you are giving, it is arthritis, carditis, chorea, arrhythmia marginatum and subcutaneous nodules and the percentages you already know by now, arthritis in 75, carditis in 50 to 60, chorea in around 5%, arrhythmia marginatum in 1% and subcutaneous nodules in less than equal to 1%. The early features, that is the features presenting early in the course of acute rheumatic fever are ACE, that is arthritis, carditis and erythema marginatum and those presenting slightly later are chorea and subcutaneous nodules. Primary prevention is that which is after the diagnosis of acute pharyngitis to prevent the development of initial attack of acute rheumatic fever that is eradicating group A streptococcus and appropriate antibiotic needs to be started before the ninth day of the start of symptoms. It is very important. And secondary prevention is that which is done after the diagnosis of the first episode of acute rheumatic fever to prevent subsequent attacks of acute rheumatic fever, the dose and duration you already know. And it is started after completing the antibiotic course for the first or the current episode. So thank you so much for a patient watching and please do share the knowledge. I hope I was able to make it clear. Thank you.